Salam alaikum. This is Dr. Amina Al Dean, and I wanted to. Well, I've heard so much that was a little bit foreign to me about critical talk. And also, I wanted to have an opportunity to talk about the book, The Walking Quran, which I love dearly. So with me tonight, I have the honor of having Dr. Bilal Ware. He's a historian of Africa, West Africa primarily, but Africa in general, and Islam. And he earned his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. We won't mention years because that may, <laughs> may make him a little older than he seems to be. Uh, he trained in African history, African American history, and Islamic intellectual history. And his, his research, he says, spans of the last thousand years. He does more than research. The man collects music, some of which I've had the pleasure of downloading. I got to get more of him, more of it tonight. And I want to, I thought that you would be the perfect person, not only to talk about your book, you're the only person that could talk about the research that went into the book. But I was listening, I thought I knew what critical <laughs> race theory was. And then this woman got on the news saying, well, I don't want my child to be taught that he's an oppressor. And I don't want the other children either to be taught that they're victims. And I'm saying, you know, oh, I've, I've used up all my Tylenol. I don't know what to do with this wonderful misinformation. So um, thank you for the invitation <laughs> and for and for setting and for setting the table. You know, the, so so lovely. Um, so so let me say this first. It's an honor to be you know to be to be with you. Um, really really glad to be able to join you for this conversation. Thank um, you. And when you hit me with the subject, you know, matter, um, you know, that's going to frame the conversation, talking about critical race theory. Um, you know, I I feel like um, I. I'm I'm not any better positioned than you, but we'll work on this one together. So okay. here, here's what I've been able to gather. Okay? okay. What I've been able to gather is that the the legal theoretical framework, um, you know, that was um, you know, framed by a bunch of black study scholars, you know, specifically um in in the in the field of legal studies, but kind of in a broader way. Um, in the 70s and 80s, that we're trying to uh, to, to think through how uh, a justice system, which you know supposedly um, you know uh, uh, mm. applies um, equal protection under the law and is written in color neutral you know ways, um, you know at least recently <laughs> written in color neutral ways, right? Three fifths of a person wasn't color neutral, right. um, but but um, you know how how uh, policies and approaches in law that are you know uh, color neutral, at least theoretically, nonetheless consistently produce racist outcomes. So this was the original idea of critical race theory. It was how you were going to think about how race impacts outcomes um, because, uh, in spite of perhaps um, the way that institutions you know, were shaped to try to uh, function in supposedly colorblind ways. But that's not how people are talking about critical race theory now. Critical race theory now, um, especially as it's being discussed on the American political right, is just essentially a boogeyman. It's a pot that you can throw anything that makes white people feel uncomfortable about things that they did <laughs> in the past. And um, are still doing. And are still doing. Well, so that's so so that actually brings me to to, to the part that I wanted to say about it. It's like um, you know, when when we were watching um, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse walk out of you know a courtroom in Wisconsin, you know, a free, a free, a free man. Okay. Um the the thought that I, you know, that ran through my head was obviously, right, if if a 17-year-old black kid goes to a MAGA rally with an AR-15 and kills two people that are involved in that. Him again. That's what I'm saying. People, people, people were saying in my social media, they were saying that he never would have been, you know, uh, let off. He never would have been acquitted. I'm like, he never would have survived the night 
What are we what are we talking about? Exactly. They, they wouldn't have put him in jail. They'd have put him under the jail. He'd have been buried that night. So the, the point of this is when we were watching this happen, I was like, oh, if only there were a theoretical framework that would help us think critically and analytically about how this justice system produces radically different outcomes depending on, oh, wait a minute, critical race theory, uh -huh. <laughs> right? Which is what it's actually for. But but what the way that it's being used now, and it's just really, it, it's basically used that white people don't want anything that is critical about race period certain categories on the political right especially they don't want anything that's critical about race they don't want to have a conversation about race they don't want to have a critical conversation about american history they don't want to talk about um you know the 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 way in which the past you know led up to the current moment uh, that that we're in they they want to continue to operate um certain people on the political right now um, as though um, not only uh, is, is uh, that, that white supremacy is just a fiction um, that was invented and fabricated um, by, you know, uh, political troublemakers, right? Um, and so anything that approaches American history or the history of white supremacy um, with a critical eye now gets lumped under this, you know, bugaboo of critical race theory, um, and 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 they do whatever they do, and they talk about. Really, they, talk about. they were very. If you look at Charlottesville, you would think that people are very proud of white supremacy. You know, you look at Trump's rallies. I don't know how much he paid the few black people that were there, but when you look at him, it seems as though people are in love with. Yes, they and and they they want to be able to publicly embrace white supremacist doctrine. However, the word racist in America has become a bad word. So what they want now is to be able to publicly embrace white supremacist doctrine. But the 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 the, the one way that you're guaranteed to be called a racist these days is by calling a racist a racist. In other words, if you say that somebody is racist, that mm -hmm. makes you the racist in, you know, kind of contemporary American political environment, because we're, we're not allowed to like actually say, no, that's racist, because when, then we're pointing, uh, you know, the attention on race. 20 years ago, it was say, stop playing the race card. Now it's just critical race theory. It's the same conversation, right? Mm -hmm. If you draw people's attention to injustice that want to conceal their participation in injustice, then they're going to throw a red flag on the play. But that, isn't it really quite difficult uh, to conceal your participation? I'm just remembering this this conversation last night on Cuba, and I'm saying, oh, I'm, I'm you know, I'm complicit because I'm sitting here, you know, and my husband is running around trying to call the Congress or call the White House, you know, we're writing letters. But it's the same thing when I when I look over at what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians, what's everywhere I look, there's a particular color of hand in the mix. Right, but but let's 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 call the spade a spade as we used to say, okay? Which is that white white supremacy has always been dependent on selective amnesia. Okay, yeah. it has always been dependent upon. Um, <laughs> Here's the thing that comes to mind. That scene in The Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Exactly. Right? That yeah. that you know we're gonna project you know this this authority and we're gonna do these things, but you're not allowed to talk about it. Don't look at us. Don't name us. <laughs> um, so 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 I'll, I'll give you the, the example that came to mind for me. I watched this was a few years back. It was when I believe it was when um, uh, Pakistan, I think, first, you know, um, was was on the verge of acquiring nuclear capability. OK, and I watched this hour long documentary fear mongering about the war that was likely to break out between India and Pakistan. Now that, you know, Pakistan was approaching nuclear capability. I and I watched an hour long video that talked about the nationalism and the ethnic division and the political division between Muslims and Hindus. Do you know what never appeared in the one hour documentary? What? A discussion of the British Empire, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the British partition of yeah. South Asia into India and Pakistan in this way. So the point is, is it, it what, what we used to say, throw the rock and hide the hand. Yeah. 
that that that's how white supremacy has always functioned. Like it 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 creates these tears, these breaches, these fissures in human society. But you're not allowed to talk back to them. You're not allowed to name them, because white supremacy tells you what's what. You don't tell it what's what. Mm, you know, on Netflix, there's a I guess it's a docu I guess it's a documentary called How to Become a Tyrant. If you haven't watched it, you got I seen it. I saw it, yeah, a little while back. Yep. Go please continue though. And um I was sitting there saying, okay, checklist. Okay, we got that. We got this. <laughs> then this morning I read that in the last mm -hmm. what since 2005, 2008, 2200 newspapers have closed. Half of all what, the what's a what's a newspaper? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's where the that's where the youth is. Go ahead, click continue. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing about it is you can't get the kind of investigative journalism on TikTok or um what is it, Instagram, Facebook that you can get above. from reading a serialized story in a local newspaper. Yeah. No, there's, there's no, no exposure it. of uh, civil servants, you know, so they get to go off and, and serve themselves. They don't have to serve us anymore because we don't have anybody watching them. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm saying, you know, when you put that next to what's what's happening and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very cramped. You know, and I'm easily made claustrophobic. And I'm looking at what happened with the Arbery trial. Are they back yet? Yeah, yeah. They're so so the Arbery trial, you know, they 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 found them, found them, all, they found them all guilty. Um they're all they all got felony murder. So so we had we had a good outcome um, you know, in, in that particular instance. Um, you know, how many, many how much left. time did they get? Two days? They, they haven't. They haven't. They, there, there hasn't been sentencing yet. But I feel, I feel like, I feel like we couldn't, we couldn't really have hoped for for a better outcome, especially with an eleven to one, um, you know, uh, white uh, to to black right. jury. I, so, mm -hmm. so I felt like this was one of those instances where it was so egregious. And and I and and I, I do want to say this. Um, Yes, it's very, very clear that there are significant portions of this country that are trying to move backwards, right? Yeah. Um, but, but, there, but, but, but there, but there are people um, who are willing to stand up now in this generation in ways that wasn't possible before, and and we got to acknowledge that and like celebrate those people, and because we need, we're gonna need their help. What made the Floyd uprising so significant? was that for the first time that I had ever seen, it was more non-Black folks out there mar marching um, for a Black martyr than it was Black folks. And that, that to me, like, was, was this moment of, um, of hope. And, and the, it's, look, 400 plus years of institutional oppression doesn't get um, turned over with one verdict. It doesn't, you know, happen in one summer. You know, it, it doesn't. It doesn't happen, you know, because of people's social media feeds. Like it takes sustained work and sustained effort. But we do have to signal that, like this outcome with Arbery is different than what happened with Trayvon Martin, right? You know, yeah. not uh, what ten years ago, or not quite ten years ago. You know, George Zimmerman just simply walked away and became a right wing, you know, uh, celebrity. Whereas these, you know, three white men that went, that lynched this man, you know, just that that just plain lynched him, are all going to go to jail. So, so you know, these these are signposts along the road um, that we hope, you know, that we hope is progress. But the, I've said this many, many times: is is that. In, in America, you are never going to go broke betting um, on white supremacy. Um, <laughs> but how, how do we, I mean, you're involved, I'm retired. I the, the hardest thing for me to, not the hardest thing for me to talk about, but the hardest thing for me to get students to see was systemic and institutional racism. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because the the way that they're taught to think about race or racism rather is that they're they're taught to conflate racism with personal prejudice. In other words, that what makes somebody racist is the way that they feel 
or the way that they speak about people uh, of another mm-hmm. race. Um, whereas, you know, the thing to understand about, about and not even racism, like racism itself um, isn't like uh, necessarily always in the explicit, you know, interest of white supremacy. Sometimes right. feigned colorblindness <laughs> is right. more in the interest of white supremacy than explicit expressions of racism. All of that is just to say um, that uh, we've actually been trained and conditioned to think of this as a kind of individual, personal, moral, and ethical trait that inheres inside a human being. Um, so, and that's part of the reason why the right doesn't like to be labeled as racist, because to call somebody a racist means they're a bad person, right? <laughs> that 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 makes you a bad person ethically. Um, so, what they want to do is that they want to continue to reproduce racist behaviors continue to reproduce racist institutions, but never be labeled as an ethically deficient human being in the process. Um, So when you zoom out and you talk about how the institutions themselves produce racist outcomes time and time again, and that unless you're actively struggling from uh, against them, then you are complicit with them. If you continue to benefit from those structures, then you are morally compromised by your participation in those structures. That changes the nature of the conversation. And that's the change that people don't want. That's the reason why they're pushing back against this bugaboo of critical race theory. Because as soon as it becomes clear that the entirety of the structure needs remedying, then Mm -hmm. nobody gets away safe. Everybody has to implement changes in their own family, in their own corporation, in their own institutions of education, in their own circle to remedy this. Otherwise, they do get marked and stigmatized as an ethically uh, deficient. But you're not going to do that. I mean, you won't give up your place and power. I want to come back and I'm going to take a quick break, a minute or two. And I want to come back and talk some more about this because the hand that's like this is never going to become People, like people don't like giving up that upper hand. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I will be right back. This is Dr. Amina Aldean having a wonderful talk with Dr. Bilal Ware. And we're talking about critical race theory, the walking Quran, and all the other news. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Amin al D, and I'm speaking with Dr. Bilal Ware. And before we go back to our wonderful conversation, I just have to say, what is the temperature out there? In Cali? Yeah. Um, today it was like 70, 71. You know, you know, that that's criminal. <laughs> Our producer is in Toronto where it's minus one. Oh man. I'm in Maryland where it's or I just want you to know. Yeah. There are some things that are also criminal, you know. So I'm out here here you so I'm you know, my originally from DC. Um my, my father had a locksmith shop on 13th and H in Northeast DC. And um, I can't say the DC winters were particularly, particularly hard, but I know it got cold. Now I ended up going to to move into Minneapolis. I finished my undergrad there. I taught at Northwestern University in Chicago, and then I taught at the University of Michigan for 10 years. 
I have cashed out on winter. I am enjoying these <laughs> California winters. I pay. I paid yeah, into the kitty and I'm cashing out. I ain't going back to winter. <laughs> Great business stuff. I, I I can understand. I want to. You know, what, whose trial was it? Uh, I think it was a Mount Arbery, mm. where lots of the preachers went. Yep. Yep. Are they pushing CRT? No, um, the, 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 the preachers. So, okay. So let's, let's, let's first of all, set it in context. Um, the, during the Arbery trial, um, the calculus made by the defense attorneys was that there was no world in which they could get their clients acquitted, <laughs> um, on the basis of the facts. It would have to be jury nullification. The jury would have to just simply decide that 11 white people were not going to hold these three white people accountable for this lynching because there was no way for them to win their case. They talked about this being a citizen's arrest, but nobody ever mentioned a citizen's arrest. Mm -hmm. They talked about it being self-defense, but the man wasn't armed. There is no case. So right. now, so why am I mentioning that? The reason is, is that then what the defense ended up doing systematically was mm -hmm. essentially race baiting. They tried to, 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 to bring out an us versus them mentality, right? Because they knew if they could get just one of those white jurors to ignore the fact in front of facts in front of their eyes, then they could produce a hung jury. And that and that's all they were hoping for. So now fast forward. So then it becomes that he the 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 one man stands up and says, we don't want any more black pastors. We've got, you know, Al, Al Sharpton here. And so, of course, you know, they came back with 300, you know, black pastors the, the next day. In the closing arguments, the female, you know, defense attorney talks about um, Ar Ahmaud Arbery's uh, crusty toenails and this, that, and the other, you know, basically trying to try, trying to paint him out as some kind of animal. And she said he had no business being where he, where he was. What they were looking for was just one racist juror. <laughs> what they were hoping is that they could they could trigger in somebody an us versus them response. So now, part that uh, uh, making that statement about those black pastors that was part of that strategy, and of course it backfired, <laughs> right? right. Um, because you know you had you know people of faith show up because they're they're providing moral support and community solidarity for a group that has had one of its children murdered. Right. Period, full stop. That's not representing critical race theory. That's not representing any political party or any political outcome. Right. That is standing in solidarity with a person who has been dehumanized by white supremacy. And what one of my favorite uh, books, and I, I teach it in, um, in almost all of my classes where we, we work on the diaspora, is uh, Michael Gomez's lovely book, Exchanging Our Country Marks. Um, and one of the things that, that, I, that I really appreciate in that particular work is he talks about the significance of funerals for the enslaved, how you could find time and time again that people would walk, um, you know, like a day's walk on their only day off on a, on a Sunday to, 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 to bury a, an enslaved person that was distant kin to them or, or that they just happened to know. And right. the way that he read this was so significant to me, which is that the, in, in a world that is telling you that you mean nothing, yeah, we're going to stand together when you pass to say that you mean something, that your humanity counts. So that's how I read those Black pastors showing up, was in that protest tradition of saying that you can take our rights away, you can take try to take our, our lives away, but we are still going to stand together and honor, um, you know, the, the, the victims of this sacrificial uh, system of white supremacy. So that, that was how I understood it. It didn't have anything to do with politics. It didn't have anything to do with critical race theory. It was just standing, um, you know, with the, with the victim of a tragedy. Um, and we, you know, frankly, you know, we, we, we should have, we should have had, you know, uh, uh, more, more Muslim representation there. Shouldn't have left it just for the for the Christian pastors. I know. Pastors. But since you mentioned the word mm. Muslim, let me turn a corner. Do immigrants think that critical race theory applies to them? <laughs> well, obviously it depends on the immigrants. That we do. It, depend, it depends on the immigrants. Um, but let, let let's just let's let's put it this way. 
Um, I think that one of the things that has been um, one of the, you said we turn the corners, right? So we'll turn a couple corners. One of the corners that I feel like we've turned um, is that um, I think that, that beginning with the Floyd protests um, in, you know, spring of, of 2020, okay. yeah. you saw um, for the first time on both the black and the Palestinian side, not for the first time, but really in a, in a, in a much more visible public fashion, um, the realization that the struggle against Zionism and the struggle against, you know, a, a, a white supremacist state were connected struggle. Um, you saw, you know, um, uh, Mexican Americans and other Latinx folks out marching in big numbers, saying, right. "My struggle is your struggle." Right? People started to understand um, across the world that the sh the struggle against white supremacy. Um, as embodied in this particular moment of cruelty and brutality, it was something that struck a kind of universal chord. So I feel like for a lot of the the the, the Arabs who have been checking the white box on their <laughs> on their you know census, no seriously, oh I know. Let's, let's be let's be real about it. Um, you know, people that were considering themselves white and have dealt with histories of anti-black racism in their own countries, right? Mm -hmm. And have have you know oftentimes you know looked down at, at black communities. Let's let's be let's be blunt about this. It was an Arab store owner that called the police on George Floyd. They got him killed in the first place, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> Cut foods. Mm -hmm. So the point of all that is just to say that in the aftermath of that. I think that a lot of people of color started to reassess their position vis-a-vis -vis the black struggle. Now, as it happens, many in the, the immigrant Muslim community in North America, um, their class interests prevail over their racial interests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are oftentimes, you know, because of the ninth, the way the 1965 immigration, you know, post 65 immigration policy mm -hmm. was structured, there are often people that come from wealthier backgrounds. Okay, um, and so therefore they 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 tend to you know kind of align themselves or hope to align themselves in many instances with the middle class here, and oftentimes that means looking down on you know people like me who you know my father had a sixth grade education, you know I was in and out, I, I never lived at the same street address for a consecutive year until I was nine years old. Like we, we were, we were poor, poor, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so, so I feel like um, a lot of the, the, the immigrant um, Muslim community specifically um, hadn't been doing the work to actually kind of relate to the black struggle. And I think that the Floyd uprisings kind of changed that. So it just, it, it didn't, it, it didn't change it. Let me say this, it marked a moment of opportunity um, where we could uh, realign people's understandings um, about the fundamental interrelationship between Islamophobia <laughs> and, and white supremacy, between anti-immigrant sentiment and white supremacy, between Zionism and white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and if we do the work, um, then, then, then this next generation that we raise up will have a more enlightened consciousness about this. God willing. No, that's 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 good. I mean, uh, I was just in Dr. Camilla Rashad's intensive and I was shocked by some of the younger than I, well everybody's younger than me, but younger than I, uh, men and women there who didn't believe in critical race theory. And I'm saying it's not a faith. What what are you talking about? You, know, you don't believe, you live in it. So what about living don't you believe? I mean, I don't quite get well, that. The thing, the thing is, I mean, from, from my standpoint, it's just, it, unfortunately, um, the way that the right has, has labeled this has made it an us versus them. In other words, it's become a doctrine of political affiliation that if you lean towards the political right, then you have to say that you're against critical race theory or you don't believe in it, even if you don't actually know what it is, right? Even if you don't, don't have any understanding of what it is, it's just become an us versus them mentality. And, I, and I've had this conversation with, you know, with people you know, across the political spectrum. Um, and this is something that I learned, you know, really specifically from studying the successful West African Islamic movements is that, um, you know, so somebody like, say, say again. 
I want to turn to that next. Inshallah, yeah, we'll do it. So somebody like Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, for, for example, he never um, aligned himself with any kind of political authorities. And the, the, the overwhelming approach that was always taken by successful Muslim uh, scholars and Muslim movements in West Africa was to remain distinct from political movements and political parties, because as soon as you are a, a part of their structures, then you lose the capacity for autonomous ethical critique of how they behave. And so the thing that I'm always trying to remind folks is that you can ally yourself with, with a, a political party or a political movement, and we should. We should take action to try to, you know, to create um, you know, a more just society, a more ethical society. But you can never, as a, at least as a Muslim, you can never derive your identity or your values from a political party or political system. Thank you that, very much. That's nonsensical. And like, like that's day one lesson from Malcolm that, that, I, that I gathered is that, you know, yes, I, I may in point of fact vote Democrat, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that I trust Democrats. It, does, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that they own my vote. It doesn't mean that I believe in everything that they that they believe in. My ethical right. values and the things that I believe in um, as a human being come from mm -hmm. my religious and ethical system, um, and and not the other way around. And unfortunately, I feel like a lot of people they derive their principal identity from the way that they are situated in relation to the political sphere. Whether they're progressive, liberal, you know. I mean, it just seems as though there's so much basic confusion. And I'm going to end with this on this particular topic until we come back to it again. Um, I think people have lost sight of what it is and are so fearful of white supremacy that they're scared to take a side. Mm. But I'm gonna just leave that there. This is yeah. Dr. Amin al Dean and Dr. Bilal Ware. We're having a wonderful conversation, which I intend to continue at a later date, but we're gonna come back and talk about the walking Quran. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Amina al Dean, and I'm here with Dr. Bilal Ware. Well, just talking. How about that? We'll just call it just talking. Critical race theory, black folks, immigration, you know. But right now, I want to spend a little bit of time on the walking Quran. Tell me how you thought it up, how you set out to do the research. Because the book is dynamite. For those in the audience listening, it's the Walking Quran, uh, and I'm gonna ask my producer to put the full title uh, on the screen. It is delightful. Go ahead. Um, so, what what could I say? <laughs> I mean, the book the book started out um, as my doctoral thesis and my PhD dissertation in history at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and so I started doing the research for it um, in 2001 and 2002, living in Senegal for 18 months. Um, my eldest daughter actually was born there um, during the time I was doing, doing the research. 
Um, and that that dissertation was uh, it was called Knowledge, Faith and Power. It was a history of Quran schooling in Senegal. Um, but when I sat down to, to rework it, to make it into a book, um, I wanted to make um, uh, bigger arguments um, about the role of Islamic education in West Africa and how it functioned. Um, and one of the things that I was consistently, you know, kind of meditating on was about the centrality of the body and the way that um, uh, the um, rhythm, uh, recitation, um, sometimes physical discipline, particular bodily positions were associated with memorization. I just really was was very attentive to the fact in that about the hundred hours of interviews that I had done, a lot of people talked about growing up in Quran schools in West Africa as being this intensely bodily experience. Now so, say more about right there. Yeah, go ahead. Say more about that because I am in cahoots with a graduate student who wants to do a little bit of research on that and compare yep. it with America. So say a little bit more. Okay, so I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you the the example that I use, um, the main example, one of the main examples that I use in the book. So one of the things that you'll see if you go to um, a, a West African Quran school, um, you might see. Um, so you'll still see children, for example, learning on the lauf, the wooden tablet, which is the the that we see, he see in authentic narrations. That's the way the Quran was taught in the Prophet's own time. Peace be upon him. That's them. the way I learned. <laughs> Mashallah, it's beautiful, and that's that. You know, that's the way my daughters learned Quran when we were in Synagogue. Um, you mm -hmm. know, uh, at later occasions. So one of the ways that that this will sometimes be tested is that the, the students will have to put the the lauf on top of their head. Um, to recite back to the teacher the verse that they were memorizing from on the tablet. Um, but one of the things that you might see, and I, I actually saw this in different forms, is that after the lesson is finished, to erase the lesson, sometimes the kids would literally lick the Quran right off of the tablet, or people would wash it with water and then drink it. Um, I heard stories about the water that was used to wash the slate boards in the Quran school. You might have a couple hundred students would be collected in a big pot in the middle of the school, and neighbors from around the neighborhood would come by and gather um, cups of the water to take home to bathe with in order to absorb the power of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So this was something that that the Quran was literally being drunk, ingested, and brought into the body as mm -hmm. part of the process of teaching, which is something that I had never seen any place else, you know, had hadn't heard of. Um, and I got to be honest, when when I first saw this and read about it. I thought it was the shirkiest thing that I had ever seen. <laughs> like, I just didn't. Like, it wasn't part of my understanding of you know what 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 orthodox Islamic education should look like. Because why would you ingest you know this 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 word? So when I was doing that research that shifted the book from that dissertation to the to the book, um, I, I started studying the earliest teacher training manuals that I could find. So mm -hmm. the, the, the earliest ones that I could find were Maliki texts from the second and third centuries of, of Islam. One mm -hmm. by a person called Muhammad ibn Sahnun, and then another about a century later by a scholar called Al-Qabisi. Now, in both of these books, they say, they transmit hadith that say, the sign of a man worthy of the name man in the time of the, the, the four caliphs was that you would see him with ink around his lips from licking the revelation off of his tablet. They said that the children used to collect wash wa the wash water from the slate boards in the school in the middle of the school and that it would be used for ingestion and for bathing. In other words, this practice of interiorizing the Quran itself was something that was old as Islam itself. And this yeah. practice that I didn't see associated with Quran schooling in the Arabian Peninsula or other places, it wasn't some kind of West African invention. It right. was an Islamic invention that had been abandoned <laughs> right. in almost every other part of the Muslim world, right. but still kept alive in West Africa. So go. I started to understand that some of the things that I was seeing um, in West African Islamic education that looked different from the way that Islam was taught in many other places, it wasn't because Africans had innovated. It was because the Africans were the only ones that were still doing it the old fashioned way. <laughs> they were the only ones still doing it the original way. So that ultimately became the core of the argument of the book, which is that the, the, the basic goal of traditional Islamic education isn't to teach some kind of fictional organ called the mind. Because remember, the Quran never mentions the mind. 
The Quran mentions the heart almost 200 times yeah. exactly. So the idea is to bring the, the 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 Quran into the entirety of a human being. To and then that's when I realized, and I literally had the the, the, the title came to me in a dream. Um, he was the Quran walking upon the earth. That's what we it was. All, we all know the hadith about the Prophet Alayhi And I realized when the night that I had that dream that that's what was holding together all of the different practices of embodiment in West African Islamic schooling. They're not trying to teach people the Quran the way that we're trying to teach kids mathematics in a, in a third grade school class. Mm -hmm. They're trying to rewrite the flesh and blood of the children of Adam to make people into living exemplars of the Quran. The idea is not to, to teach it in an abstract way, but to literally inscribe it onto the children of Adam. So that, once I had clarity about that, then the rest of the book fell into place. All kinds of things that had never made any sense now made perfect sense because I understood that there was a different epistemology. There was a different approach to knowledge itself that was at the heart of traditional Quran schooling. And I came to really understand that this is one of the principal things that we can learn by looking to West Africa in this day and age is that it, in all honesty, if you study Islamic education from one end of the Muslim world to the other, it's almost always essentially a colonized education. It, it is. is it, it, it takes place in colonizers type schools. People don't learn the Quran on the ground with a, with mm -hmm. a wooden tablet across their lap. They learn it sitting at desks <laughs> with a notebook mm -hmm. and with computer. They, they learn the same way their colonizers learn. They teach the same way their colonizers teach. Um, and so one of the beautiful things about Islam in West Africa is it preserved a bunch of these tiny details about what Quran schooling looked like. Um, but it's not just what it looks like, it creates a certain kind of human being when you're not just reading the Quran from a book, but you're literally ingesting it, feeling yourself charged with the power of the Quran itself, like a kind of sacred trust that you bear within you on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, so, so that became the, the foundation um, of, the, of the book. I love this book and uh, I don't know where my producer is, but what, uh, do you have one a copy of the book there with you? Um, it's downstairs, so I would have to get up. But it, the, the full title is the, the Walking Quran, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge and History in West Africa. Um, and it does. Yeah. It covers a thousand years. It it's, uh, basically around, begins around 1000 CE and it talks about the history of Quran schooling um, in West Africa. The book is awesome. Um, I've taught it which meant I had to read it every time I thought it to see if I could discover something new. But it's one of those texts where you do discover something new every time you read it. Don't be smiling because it ain't you. No, um, it's definitely not me. I'm smiling. <laughs> well, here, you want to know what I'm smiling about? Yeah. I'm, I'm smiling about the fact that, 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 that if people can find benefit um, in the book, I'm smiling with the hope that God will accept the deed from me. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but it is. I mean, it's a wonderful book. Because when I first saw the title, I said, The Walking Quran. Then I saw the Arabic inside the body. And I said, Aha, he's got it. You know, because I went to a madrasa in uh, Morocco. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yep. Uh, me and my teachers, we, we did a battle because I was too old to sit on the floor. And no, I'm not sleeping on that, you know. So we went back and forth and they made some wonderful accommodations. But I could see what you're talking about all around me. Yeah. And that in one of the, I don't know if you've been to the kind of American Senegalese school that's outside of Dakar. There's, there's, there's more than one, but yes, there was, we, we, uh, I, I visited actually uh, at least two. Okay, which two were they? Um, the Senegalese American Academy actually in Dakar, and then I'm forgetting the name of the second one that's just outside of it. Okay, and what what is going on in them? Um, well, it depends on which are, which which of the schools, but essentially, I mean, I, I feel like um, the there there's well, okay. So in the first of those schools, um, in order to be accredited by the state, you obviously have to 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 uh, you know maintain the official state authorized educational program. But I do believe that there's an effort to try to bring together 
um, the, the, the kind of traditional, um, you know, teaching, uh, teaching of Islam with the modern state structure uh, teaching as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I talk about quite a bit, actually, about those efforts, especially in chapter five of the Walking Quran, um, to try to essentially take elements from the modern schooling approach and assimilate them to the traditional format of, uh, of Islamic education rather than the other way around. Um, and I feel like that that's kind of the most, you know, interesting, you know, uh, thing that you see taking place. So I'll give you one another example. There's a there's an amazing brother um, in the city of Tuba, um, Elijah Njai, um, who runs a Quran school there that probably has, I don't know, maybe a thousand you know, uh, uh, students there. Um, they learn traditional memorization. He's also, a, 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 I think, like something like a six degree black belt in judo. So he not literally it. teaches not only Quran, but Kung Fu. <laughs> um, to, to, no joke. Um, he, he teaches Quran and Kung Fu to, to the students. And they, they also learn science, mathematics, all of the things that come from the, 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 the and, they, and they consistently perform and they have excellent Tajweed. So he's somebody that was raised in the Tariqa Muradiya, you know, uh, a scholar of Islam, a scholar of the writings of Shaykh Ahmed Ubamba. And these are the beautiful experiments that I see taking place, you know, time and time again in those contexts is people that are rooted in the tradition and willing to borrow what ever um, uh, benefits the tradition, but they're not having their approach to knowledge, their approach to teaching and schooling be dictated um, by, uh, <laughs> by a colonizer's approach to knowledge. Let's just put it that way. You have a question from someone in the audience. I think you got a glimpse at it. Okay. It says, I love the book oh, because man. it introduces the reader to so Abdul Qadr Quran. Yeah. His story is amazing. What about him did you leave out? So Abdul Qadir Khan, just to, 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 to let folks know, um, his, his story, I, I'm actually trying to write a, a, a book that's really about him. Um, you know, now. Wow. Um, but he figures prominently in chapter three which, of the Walking Quran, which is called The Book in Chains. And, and essentially his story is the story of the first successful, successful abolitionist movement in the black world. Um, because yeah, because between 1770 and 1776, um, he uh, they essentially abolished the not only the Atlantic slave trade but the institution of slavery itself from an Islamic polity in the the Senegal River Valley. Ultimately, he gets assassinated in 1806, and the slave trade is reintroduced. But there's a 30 year period where the slave trade is illegal, <laughs> um, where, 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 and and Abdul Qadir Khan offers liberty to any enslaved person in his territories who will recite a single verse of the Quran, a single ayah of the Quran, because for him, not a single letter of the Quran should ever be held in bondage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that story of the of the the uh, uh, an abolitionist movement that precedes the Haitian Revolution, right? That precedes the, the, the foundation of the London Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. And indeed, the Reverend Thomas Clarkson, the founder of the London Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, mm -hmm. he writes a full 30 pages on Abdul Qadir Khan's movement in his first treatise opposing the slave trade. So this, mm -hmm. he, this is a, a, the, the founder of Western abolitionism saying that he took his inspiration from this African Muslim abolitionist hero. So Khan's story, um, I tried to get as much of a, as, as I could in there. What about it did I, did I, was I unable to tell? Um, part of what I was unable to tell was that, that Khan himself um, was one of these figures um, who was understood to be, uh, have an overpowering spiritual presence. Um, wow. When he was, when he was, uh, <laughs> one of the stories is that when he was captured in a battle by one of these slave trading um, kings, um, that there was a court cleric that uh, suggested that he ought to be put to death <laughs> for, for treason um, against this slave trading king. Um, and Abdul Qadir Khan um, looked at the man, said some words beneath his breath, breath and that man began barking like a dog and was 
unable to re return his capacity to, to, to speak. Um, in, in one of the versions of the story, they say that this was the reason why the king eventually actually set Abdul Qadir Khan free in spite of the fact that he had taken him prisoner because everybody was afraid of what might happen to them if they executed a man like this. So they ultimately liberated him. And indeed, at the spot where he was buried in Futa Toro after his ultimate assassination, um, a spring uh, uh, came up where there had been no source of water um, that ultimately uh, created a pond that now people come uh, to for, for, for blessing and to, to get water. Um, another one of the miracles associated with Abdul Qadir Khan is that when he was assassinated by those slavers, um, he was given a hasty burial. Um, uh. the, when the scholars heard about this, they all assembled. Hmm. They disinterred him and gave him an honored ceremony. This was 37 days after his assassination. And eyewitnesses to the event said that, that his hair looked like it had been oiled and combed, that his limbs moved without any rigor mortis. <laughs> freaky, freaky. And, and that he had not decomposed in the lightest and that, and, uh, before they, they buried him. So, so Abdul Qadir Khan was was a was a was a spiritual and social hero. He was somebody that struggled against the slave trade in the 1770s, um, mm. and he was successful in fighting off French uh, slavers, British slavers, and Mauritanian slavers. Um, he he did. Uh, you guys think about this as the as the Lincoln move, the Emancipation Proclamation, right? You free the slaves of your enemy because it weakens them politically. Abdul Qadir Khan did this in 1775. He offered freedom to any of the enslaved uh, black folks in Mauritanian society and he, he he armed them so that they could fight against their former masters I love it <laughs> you know you know you're giving us and I'm gonna get you if I have to come out to you see where <laughs> because I'm, I'm thinking of this month and how we need to focus on something else beside consumer society. So I'm thinking, I know you do some babysitting <laughs> and I love it. I love men to babysit. Yes. Um, is Tuesday a good day for you? Tuesday is usually a very good day for me. Okay. If I can do two hours, one, one, Tuesday, one, I think it's, it's, I want us to focus on African Islam. Happy to do it. I'm at your service. Okay. Now, now see, you said that Allah be my witness. Don't make me have to chase you. God, 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 God what does Quran say? God suffices for both of us as a witness. So uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to do it. Okay. So we will set that up. This has been not only instructive and thoughtful. I hope all the people listening go out and buy the book. It is well worth reading twice, at least. You read it the first time because it's curious. You read it the second time to study. This is Dr. Amin al -Din. I've had a more than pleasant hour with Dr. Bilal Ware, who will be back shortly. And we're gonna do some Tuesdays in African Islam. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>